Yeah, well, I've, I've appropriated the term from Bourdieu, who's a well-known sociologist, but I'm not claiming to be necessarily using it in the same way as he uses it. But let me tell you how I want to use the term. That um, economic decisions and political decisions are made in the context of a set of beliefs, values, and preferences. And they often affect the way people behave. They affect the way policy is made. And I want to think of the, those being fairly slow-moving variables that can, you can get more or less of some kind of attribute. So stronger democratic values would be an example. More people who believe in the importance of democracy. And for me, that would be accumulating a particular kind of cultural capital. And then that capital plays a role in the way that the society works. So that's the way I think about the concept of, of cultural capital. Yeah, we, we have lots of tools, that I, survey tools, for asking people questions about their preferences, attitudes, and beliefs. So to the extent that that's a reliable way of getting information, and I think it has quite a lot of validity, then we can think of that as allowing us to think about differences in the cultural capital of different countries, or different regions within countries, or different families, whatever level we want to employ the idea. Uh, and I think in principle we can, we can bring survey type information uh, to bear in trying to measure those differences. Um, so I, I do think it's something which is potentially an operational idea as well. That, so, so in my lecture that I'm giving today, I'm going to, in a rather specific way, but, but there are a number of ways you could do this, but in one very specific way, I'm going to suggest how we can bring it inside an economic model of policy choice and political economy. So I'm trying to bring it together with other ideas so that we can see what difference it would make to the way we think about issues by bringing it in. There is a distinction between choices and outcomes, meaning that I can make a policy choice, say Brexit. I, you know, we decide we're going to stay in the European Union or leave the European Union. Um, and that will lead to a series of policy outcomes from the choice um, and, and other kinds of outcomes. You know, we'll end up trading or not trading a certain amount. So, so there is a distinction between the policy choices <coughs> and the outcomes that we get. But the, the pol policy outcomes and policy choices are probably in most cases not tremendously different. Though. Mm -hmm. Those three things I do view as distinct. So, so what's a a, a, the kind of political outcomes or, or political choices are things like voting decisions and who you elect to the legislature or to become president or prime minister. Those, those are the, the, the political outcomes. The, when people uh, decide what to vote for, or uh, well, I suppose that's the most, the most relevant thing here, they're affected by their values and preferences and, be and information, beliefs, all of those things go into the decisions that they make to achieve those political, uh, to make those political choices. And then those political choices affect the policies that are ultimately going to be put in place. So having assembled a particular parliament, that parliament then has to make decisions about taxes or public spending or anything else. So those are the policy outcomes. So you have the sort of values and preferences, they affect the political choices, those affect the policy outcomes. Now what's different in, in the normal way of operating in the lecture I'm giving today is I'm then interested in the feedback between policy outcomes and values and preferences. So that you can then having experienced particular policies and with the sort of dynamics of influence that happen through either families or other social networks, you can actually lead to changes in people's values and preferences from the policy outcomes that are chosen. Indeed, indeed most 
political systems, or those that are defined as democratic, are set up to make policy responsive to what citizens want. So those values and preferences become reflected in the political choices that, that people, people make. Yes, or, or environmental policy in general, but climate change would be a very good example. Um, indeed, I would go further. I'll make a, quite a strong claim here. Um, I, I think almost certainly we will not be able to meet the challenge of uh, climate change, man-made climate change, if you want to use that term, without significant behavioral change, which comes through people really reflecting on their values and preferences that drive the lifestyles that affect the extent to which people um, are responsible for carbon emissions. So I, I actually do view this as absolutely central to the question of whether we will, in the end, get on top of the problem of climate change. Well, I, I, I think you put your finger on something very important when you use the term speaking different languages because one, there are many aspects to this. Part, part of it is how politicians who are drawn from an elite class are experiencing the world differently. Maybe they don't experience as much poverty or uh, the, the downside of global... So, so they, could be, they could be disconnected because of their life experiences being different from the life experiences. So, so that's one reason for a disconnect. But actually, I think an interesting reason for the disconnect is around the kind of consequences of political correctness, as we call it. I don't know if that translates well into Spanish as a term. Political correctness for the way policy debate happens. One of the reasons why politicians like Donald Trump, I think, have been successful is they speak the language of the dinner table in politics. So the things that people say in bars and at dinner tables and at football matches or whatever it would be, that, they sim that politicians simply don't say. Now, of course, sometimes that's good because people are not perhaps thinking hard about what they're saying in some environments. But in other cases, I think it's very much narrowed the terms of policy debate so that the language of politics is not the language of ordinary citizens. They're not addressing and thinking about the concerns that ordinary citizens have. And when that happens, when politicians come along and suddenly seem to be talking in the same language that ordinary citizens talk, that gives those politicians a connection which perhaps some of the traditional political elites simply were unable to connect with. And I do think we are, at least, you know, in the UK is an example I know well. We all know about the United States to different degrees. I think these are examples of countries where the disconnection between political elites and the citizens is manifesting itself in certain phenomena. But it, yes, exactly. I mean, in, in some places, it, the change happens in new leaders, like you know, Donald Trump, who, who comes out of a totally uh, non-political background and becomes, becomes president. So, um, and, but in other countries, like in the UK, the party system in the UK makes it very difficult for new leaders to emerge. You know, we do, I mean, Ma Macron in France can emerge because it's a presidential system. So he, he has not got a base of support in, in, in Parliament. But even so, he's able to emerge as an alternative politician through the presidential system. Whereas in my country, we don't have a presidential system, so it's much harder for new politicians to emerge. It's, it's because the key to electoral success is through parties. And new parties find it very difficult to emerge. So a good example, uh, we have, a, we have a, a politician who's now resigned as the head of our UKIP party. So UKIP was the main party arguing for Brexit. And his name was N Nigel Farage. Now, he was an, an MEP, but he was never a member, or has never been a, a member of the House of Commons. Uh, and that's because UKIP, his party, cannot get any MPs elected. Well, they had one, but it was a bit of a strange situation, a, def a defector from the Conservative Party. So it wasn't really a proper 
election in the conventional way. So the bottom line is it's very hard for a new politician to emerge, even though that's a, a recognized figure. Everyone on TV would know who Nigel Farage was, but he's never been part of the standard ele uh, political elite, meaning an elected member of the House of Commons. Yes, and, but the reason is, of course, that that was a referendum. There is no way that Brexit, I think, would ever have happened from a purely parliamentary process. It happened because, somewhat exceptionally for our political system, there was a decision to call a referendum. And once you're having a referendum, then the terms of normal politics are suspended because uh, what matters is just what a majority of the population want. Um, and, and that was why our political shock, if you want to call it that, came from a very uh, non-standard um, uh, type of political event, namely a referendum. In fact, the election we've had, we're having now and the elections we've had in the past are more or less standard. They involve the normal political class competing in the normal way to of political office with very little change in the political elite, even as a consequence of Brexit. Yeah, so, so just one clarificatory point, because I think there's another, one of the reasons why small parties don't emerge in the UK and become large parties is we don't have proportional, a proportional representation system. So obviously in countries where, I mean the, the UKIP got a, very significant fraction of the vote in the UK. It just didn't get any MPs because the nature of our electoral system meant they didn't get any support in Parliament. So what is also different, I think, between continental Europe and the UK is typically there's much more use of um, proportional representation type systems, which means that these new movements, the ones you're describing, can emerge much more quickly. Of course, the UK has had new movements in the past. The Labour Party arose in the late 19th and early 20th century. So it's not, the system never changes, but it's very hard to change fundamentally the nature of the party system. Now, more interesting point that you raised, though, is where it's it all coming from. Where is, you know, the, the new movements in Italy and Greece and Spain, um, where are they coming from? And I guess if Macron in the end has a party, effectively that Macron will be another example. Uh, we're not quite sure what's going to happen if he becomes president in the legislative elections, but I guess he'll have try and get a party to back up his agenda. And I do think the issue of the, the this is a manifestation of the traditional political class being unable to connect with groups of citizens. It's not all citizens, but clearly significant groups. And um, that said, that's always been a part of the dynamics of politics. It's, you know, we, we, we don't have single issue politics, so there's always going to be some dimensions on which the political class have different views from the mass of citizens. So that's not unusual. I think what's unusual at the moment are the types of issues on which that disconnect is coming are, I think, a manifestation of a particular um, feeling that you know, the forces of globalization and change have created these disaffected groups who seek new kinds of politicians to try and project their concerns into the policy process. And that's where these political entrepreneurs, if you want to call them that, these new politicians leading new political movements are seeing the opportunity through cultivating these, these, these um, disaffected groups in society. Well, I think the U European Union faces a challenge at, at multiple levels, not just at that, that level. Because, of course, the European Union is itself dependent on national governments because at the end of the day, the European Union can do relatively little without regard to what national governments are willing to do. So I think it's fair to say, and I'll say this, I think, fairly strongly, that the, the European political elite has always been pretty disconnected from European citizens. Now, of course, I may be giving you an excessively British perspective, but I 
you know, we always do these, these quizzes about, you know, how many people can name the Prime Minister. Well, depressingly, many people cannot name the Prime Minister, but a good number of people can. Can you name your MP? Again, fewer people can name the, their own MP than probably they can name the Prime Minister. Can you name your MEP? Well, very, very few people would be. I don't think I can name my MEP now I think of it. So we, we kind of created a political elite in Europe that was almost constructed to be much more remote from the concerns of the citizens. They have no real constituency, no real power base. And so the challenge of that disconnect, I think, has been in Europe you know, forever. So that's not new. The question is, will it then collide with this other kind of disconnect, which is at the level of national politics, and make European politics even more difficult? And for that, I think the long-term problem with the European project, and, and, and I think that I noticed with, with Brexit, was that there was no real attempt in British politics to sell the European project to the citizens. The notion was, you know, we are going in this direction, we've set ourselves on a particular trajectory, and we're not really going to sell that, or we're not going to really have a proper national dialogue about that. So, so um, free mobility of labor is a perfect example. I don't remember a proper political debate around the value of freedom mobility. It was something that simply happened. Um, Tony Blair at the time was very much uh, l leading on this issue and chose to make a decision, but I don't think it followed a really intensive debate about was that the kind of world we want to live in. 